Hello, this is Michael Altos. We are starting a section on induction drugs and sedatives, and this is part one. Let's start by imagining the ideal IV anesthetic. Unfortunately, such a drug does not yet exist, but we can list some of the properties that we look for in the ideal IV anesthetic. <clears throat> we would want a drug that's water soluble and stable for storage, that doesn't cause pain on injection, that doesn't cause any tissue damage if the drug extravasates out of the IV. A drug that doesn't cause any histamine release or hypersensitivity or risk of allergic reactions. We'd like to see a smooth, rapid onset of effect and then rapid metabolism to inactive metabolites. A steep dose response curve, and these would allow us to carefully titrate the drug to get the exact rapid effect that we need. Minimal side effects, especially cardiac and respiratory depression. A drug that can lower ICP and cerebral metabolic rate. A rapid, smooth recovery with minimal undesirable side effects like nausea, vomiting, amnesia, headache, and dizziness. Well, that drug doesn't exist, but we'll start by discussing propofol, one of our favorite anesthetic drugs, because it has many of these ideal characteristics. Propofol works at the GABA receptor. It enhances inhibitory transmission through GABA. Propofol in the vial is an emulsion in intralipid. Intralipid is a fatty substance made out of soybean oil, glycerol, and, leg, and egg lecithin. By the way, do people who have egg allergies need to avoid propofol? Well, most egg lecithin is from egg yolk, and most patients who have egg allergies are allergic to the egg white, which is where the protein is that causes the allergic reaction. In general, patients who have egg allergies are able to receive propofol without issue, but if you have a concern about severe anaphylaxis, you may want to look for an alternative. The intralipid is significant because it supports bacterial growth, and for that reason we need to be extra careful to use an aseptic technique when drawing up and administering propofol. The contents of the open vial should be discarded as well as any tubing after 12 hours, or some guidelines say 6 hours. There isn't really evidence to support this, but just the knowledge that bacterial growth is more likely in a substance like intralipid. There's also a version of propofol called fospropofol, or aquavan. This is a prodrug which is metabolized into propofol inside the body. Fospropofol is water-soluble, which is another advantage. One notable side effect of fospropofol is intense burning in the perineal region. Now let's take a look at this familiar diagram again so we can understand the distribution of propofol in the body. Like many other lipid-soluble anesthetic agents, propofol moves from the plasma compartment into the vessel-rich group very quickly. And within a minute of injection, most of the plasma levels have dropped down as the propofol distributes into the vessel-rich group, which includes, of course, the brain and the central nervous system. Propofol has very fast redistribution out of the vessel-rich group into other compartments, and we can see that by the time we reach the 10-minute mark, most of a single bolus of propofol has left the vessel-rich group and started distributing to the muscle and fat groups. The rapid biotransformation of propofol actually exceeds hepatic blood flow, which implies that there must be some other organ contributing to the biotransformation of propofol. This extra hepatic metabolism may occur in the lungs. Propofol's biotransformation is up to 10 times faster than that of thiopental. It does undergo conjugation in the liver into inactive metabolites. But even patients with moderate cirrhosis do not seem to have any uh, slowing of propofol metabolism. Propofol is excreted via the kidneys. But again, because they are active metabolites, we really don't see any effect on propofol's uh, clinical performance in patients who have chronic renal failure. Propofol, propofol's dosing varies widely. The induction dose is typically one and a half to two and a half milligrams per kilogram 
in adults. In elderly patients, I would use less, uh, typically around one milligram per kilogram. If we're running propofol as an infusion, for sedation, typically 25 to 75 micrograms per kilogram per minute, and higher doses, say 1 to 200 micrograms per kilograms per minute, for general anesthesia. If you could measure the target plasma concentration, it would be 4 to 6 micrograms per milliliter, and this number is significant in countries where target-controlled infusion pumps are available, and you would set the target-controlled infusion to this target plasma concentration. Some say there's risk of awareness when propofol is the sole agent for anesthesia, for general anesthesia. And in my personal experience, I've seen a higher incidence of patient movement when propofol is the sole agent. It seems to work much better when it's paired with another drug, whether it's an inhalational agent, an opioid, or another IV drug like ketamine. Effects of propofol on the cardiovascular system are most notable for a significant decrease in SVR. So we see a lot of vasodilation and hypotension. It does decrease contractility as well, and it lowers preload. All of these work together to cause hypotension. And if you give propofol rapidly or to elderly patients or patients with LV failure, this decrease in blood pressure becomes more pronounced. Some have described bradycardia with propofol, but more commonly we see tachycardia with induction. In the respiratory system, we see profound respiratory depression and apnea, and depression of both the hypoxic and hypercapnic drives. Also a profound depression of upper airway reflexes, so patients really can't protect their airways once they've been deeply sedated with propofol. For asthmatics, this drug is acceptable, and we see less wheezing with propofol than with some other drugs, like thiopental. In the brain, propofol decreases cerebral blood flow, intracranial pressure, and metabolic rate. It is anti-emetic, and so therefore useful in patients at risk for nausea and vomiting, and it's anti-epileptic and can stop seizures. Even though it's anti-epileptic, you may see patients with myoclonic twitches, especially on induction of anesthesia, and propofol has been known to cause hiccuping. On emergence, patients who have received propofol may have euphoria, report intense dreaming, dreaming or even exhibit some amorous behavior. Propofol does have potential for abuse and addiction, but there's not a lot of evidence of, to of tolerance in most patients who have multiple exposures to propofol. Propofol burns on IV injection into a peripheral IV. What is it about propofol that burns? Most people think it's the lipid solvent, or it may be the propofol itself, that produce bradykinin. And bradykinin vasodilates it increases contact between the aqueous phase of the propofol, which is a phenol, and phenol is irritating, and the free nerve endings in the endothelium. There are a number of different ways that you can try to minimize this burning on injection through a peripheral IV. One of them involves lidocaine, and not just straight injection of lidocaine into an IV. That doesn't really seem to do much at all. But if you put the lidocaine into an IV with a tourniquet, this is basically doing a beer block. That can cause some anesthesia of the extremity and decrease burning on injection. Pretreatment with an IV opioid also helps with the burning. Another thing you can do with lidocaine is mixing the lidocaine directly with propofol. This seems to acidify the propofol emulsion and makes it less likely to cause burning. There is a case study, or a scientific study, which is done in vitro that shows there may be some accumulation of fat globules when you do that, and they hypothesized that patients may be at increased risk for thrombotic events. There aren't any human studies to back this up, though. Lidocaine also inhibits bradykinin. So since the bradykinin is, caught, is what facilitates the burning, that may also be a mechanism. 
The next effect to discuss is acute hypertriglyceridemia. This occurs due to the high fat content in propofol. In addition, propofol inhibits fatty acid oxidation. In the picture on the right, we can see a dialysis filter that has been clogged by very high levels of lipid in the blood in a patient who is on a propofol infusion. We expect to see this mostly in ICU type patients who are on prolonged high dose propofol infusions, although it could happen during a very long OR case when very high doses are used. The treatment would be to stop the propofol infusion and give insulin and dextrose in order to promote activity of the enzyme lipoprotein lipase. <clears throat> propofol infusion syndrome is an important phenomenon for you to understand. This presents as hyperlipidemia, rhabdomyolysis, metabolic acidosis, refractory bradycardia, and progressing to circulatory collapse and death. It usually occurs as an all or none syndrome with sudden onset and very high incidence of death. Again, we see this more commonly in the ICU population, patients who have prolonged high dose infusions for example, more than 75 micrograms per kilogram per minute for a duration of more than 24 hours. It's also most common in critically ill patients, especially those on vasopressors. There's also some thought that there may be a genetic susceptibility to developing propofol infusion syndrome. Now, both the intralipid solvent as well as propofol itself contribute to the development of the hyperlipidemia and the hypertriglyceridemia. But the pathogenesis is not well understood at this time. We will stop here. Please let me know if you have questions about the material, and we'll see you in the next recording.